Um, see if my computer will actually work here. Um, come on, there we go. So um, thanks everybody. It's a real honor to uh, be invited. One little clarification, I, I'm a professional engineering geologist and, and hydrogeologist, but not, not a professional engineer. Um, so I've worked with them my, my whole career. And uh, so um, let's see, on this, this talk, uh, I'm gonna be just talking about uh, plants um, from a kind of mechanics standpoint and um, you know, in my view, where you know how they can be most effective, and then um, some examples of uh, uh, what I've seen, and this kind of spawned out of some work with ranchers and farmers that had gotten frustrated with um, uh, not really understanding why they were being told, you know, why it was, you know, they were told to put aside land for for buffers and. And then in some cases where they would do it and then watch the, the plantings erode, um, they got, uh, you know, it, it added to their, their frustration. Um, and so as uh, we, uh, in, as many of you all know, uh, plants are incredibly important for all sorts of reasons. Um, and there's just a, a few as far as why, you know, why buffers have, uh, are important. Um, so I'm going to get into just a little bit more about, you know, how to, you know, from a geomorphic and bank stability um, kind of perspective of look at, at looking at, at this. So I'll start with just some real basics. This is a, a an old plot um, from a, a couple well-known geomorphologists, hydrologists, Walter Langman and, and Stan Shum. And this is on the x-axis here is effective precipitation. Um, and then on the y-axis, annual sediment yield. And so, you know, what's interesting here is when you think about, uh, well, what drives landscape erosion? Um, one is, is relief, you know, providing that potential energy that gravity delivers that wears our mountains down. And then the other is, is uh, precipitation providing the the water, the ice, whatever, um, to to really contribute to that washing away of um, the landscape, which then it, uh, of course, it ends up being our our channel network. Um, but what we see is that as precipitation goes up, uh, erosion actually diminishes, and um, as you guys probably all know, that is is because vegetation's coming in. Um, and then, you know, for I, I get, I have kind of a passion of looking at some of the, you know, history of science as well as just our, particularly some of our geologic um, aspects of uh, um, lands, you know, what we see in the geologic record. And, and there's been a lot of interesting re work in the last decade on, on how important plants were in landscape development. You know, so when plants showed up about over 385 million years ago, um, particularly trees, um, it had a pronounced effect on fluvial geomorphology in the geologic record. So when we think of bank erosion, yeah, I'm gonna point out some, you know, just some of the basics to, to really understand. And, and when you're talking to landowners, I think things that they can um, understand and, We'll be talking about, you know, what what is the bank made of? Um, of course, that's really important, and this can all be quantified. There's some, you know, better and better quanti quanti uh, quantitative tools out there that combine geotechnical type of analysis on slope stability with hydraulic analysis of uh, shear stress and erosion, um, and so. Um, the height of our bank is really important because you have these normal stresses acting down, uh, downward that can increase the uh, shear, internal shear stress on that material. And when that overwhelms the its shear strength, then you can get a, a failure. So 
a steep vertical bank is much more prone to erosion. Um, and we'll talk more too about, you know, the fact that the vegetation becomes uh, um, less capable of, of providing some of the functions it provides on these kinds of banks. Um, just a couple quick examples here. Here's a little section of the Tanaway. You can see a little bit of a riparian um, straightened channel as was typical throughout much of the world um, as agriculture, as humans, uh, you know, developed uh, the land in the valley bottoms, they would push the streams over to the flanks of the valley to maximize land use. Um, we could see that that buffer uh, got washed away here by 2011 um, and continues to cut into the, the field there. Um, and then this is more recent, and then you can see not just the field, but a, a big new house there on, at that site. Um, another example here on the uh, near I, where a spot where I had lived for a little while on uh, North Fork, still Guamish, and they, the conservation district had come in and planted it. To, was uh, the county, uh, Snohomish County had actually acquired the site and turned into a park, but was, was still maintaining it as a pasture or hayfield. Um, and then you could see some dramatic erosion there from, um, and then, uh, there's 2017 here in this photo. So, um, whoops. Um, so in bank stability, um, and uh, you know, happy to follow up and, and share um, some of the, you know tools that are out there with folks. But um, we could just think of it basically as a, a factor safety analysis of the stabilizing forces, or which are equivalent to the resisting factors that I'll explain um, and the destabilizing forces. And so when that factor safety is greater than one, you should have a stable bank. And when it's less, you have a um, failure. And so uh, the resisting factors are soil strength. Um, so that's internal friction angle. And that is dependent on typically the amount of um, in duration, um, or uh, but also mainly for your non cohesive materials, like we have for a lot of alluvium, it's uh, the grain size distribution of the material, and then cohesion. And cohesion is really linked to how much fines, particularly clay content, you have in the soil. So, so the bank you see in the image is has some definitely has cohesion because you're seeing it holding up a, a, a pretty a vertical bank, even though it is um, eroding. And so when vegetation comes in, it can provide cohesion. Those roots can hold what might, so typical alluvial soils are have no cohesion. So your cohesion factor would be zero and your vegetation can, can um, dramatically of, of increase that but only where the roots are. And we'll, we'll talk more about that um, as we get into it. But vegetation plays another really important role um, and that's in adding roughness. And in uh, the last couple of decades, there's been a lot more research about how uh, channel roughness, um, uh, particularly in, in uh, wood is a, a common element naturally, at least of adding that roughness. It, partitioning the shear stress acting on a, on the bed or banks. And um, so there's only so much energy available to do erosion based on primarily the gradient of your river and then the depth of flow or the quantity of flow. And when um, you add roughness to that, uh, that bank or bed, you're dissipating some of that. That's, you know, the energy acting on that roughness makes less energy available to do erosion. So that um, is a really important aspect of, uh, of vegetation. We'll talk more as, as the talk goes on on that. And then the driving factors are bank angle. As I explained, the more vertical the bank, um, as you can imagine, the more uh, unstable it is. Um, and then the height of that bank. Um, and you also have 
the pore pressures, particularly the soil water pore pressures that are in the bank can destabilize, be a destabilizing uh, factor. And of course, vegetation can help to uh, um, counteract some of that uh, pore pressure when you have you know, saturated soil conditions. So um, some historical, I lo again love looking back at what people uh, have observed through, through the past. Um, and here's a, a nice one uh, someone found for me in an old bookshop. Um, I think it was in New Orleans they found this, but the, um, this is, a, you can see a confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi. And then um, the title of the map is illustrating the uh, stability of wooded banks. And you can see the, the forest there in the upper right and the, the uh, 1870 uh, line of the, the channel bank and then the 1879. And so very little change along the forested bank and a lot more erosion in the, in the tilled land. So it took um, the scientific community a while to catch up, but, but we did about a hundred years. Um, so I'll show some examples. This is some work I did on uh, the west side of the peninsula where we took a data set and looked at the, the size of the woody vegetation. Um, and you can see here, there's um, lumped into bins different uh, from meadow shrub to uh, uh, trees up to uh, about nine inches in diameter and uh, um, up to 20. 21 inches and so on, up, you know, 21 to 32 um, uh, on up. And, and you see a kind of a trend and the, uh, there with the erosion uh, becoming less with the bigger trees. So um, we bin those into uh, two populations, one less than 21 inches and one greater. So, they kind of flipped here um, based on from the other plot um, so that you see the older or trees bigger than 21 inch on the left there uh, and on the right, the younger or less than 21 inch and then eroded area on the Y axis. And you can st see a statistically significant difference in those populations. Um, and here we then that last one was just eroded uh, area and then we normalize it to an erosion rate here, um, so meters per year, which is easier for people to, to think about when you're standing on a bank. And so you can look at the, the where the big trees are, the the range, the 75 percentile, um, you know, about nine, um, that's the 25 percentile down around three, and then the mean right around five meters per year, and then um, and this is on, on big rivers like the Ho and the Queets. Um, and then on the right, uh, you see that 75 percentile up around 16, 25 percentile down around eight with a mean of about 11. And that is also similar to what some folks at UC Davis found on the Sacramento, um, where the open circles are ag land where there isn't riparian forest, they didn't differentiate tree size. So they just looked at forest versus uh, non-forest. But you could see there's basically a two-fold increase in erosion rates where there weren't trees. Some other interesting work came out when the, the um, we had massive uh, floods between some, any you know, over a 500-year event is what uh, USGS, Term in, in 1993, back in the in the Missouri system, and there was some interesting work came out of that where levee failures uh, were dramatically reduced where there was significant riparian where there was significant riparian forest between the river and the levees. Um, so that um, uh, you know another when we can keep uh, basically create a buffer between our uh, our river and and our infrastructure and communities. It's a uh, another good reason to do so. So 
here's an example, go through, you know, how important it is un to understand, you know, where the, the vegetation is playing a role. So here's an example of a high bank in unconsolidated, you know, non-cohesive um, glacial outwash sediments. And there's uh, an industrial forest up there with small trees and uh, a relatively shallow root depth. So that cohesion that those trees are providing to the soil is very limited by, you know, as far as the, the bank, uh, the total height of the bank there. The other thing you see that's really important to notice is there's, you know, the trees are small, so small that there's nothing sticking around, um, even really temporarily down uh, in the water at the toe of the slope where, and that's uh, where the erosion is being uh, driven is that erosion of the, along the, the toe and that's where you get the maximum shear stresses. Um, so the, again, the vegetation, isn't really even giving getting a chance to contribute um, uh, much to the stability of that of the, in this situation. Well, when we look at our bigger trees, um, you know, and this could be again the uh, these are some examples from the west side, but but there were lots of big trees and still are in many places on, um, in the interior west. And but we see even though that you would get you know, you as, as you would think, you get much bigger root mats and root cohesion is directly proportional to the density of roots and, it, and to the diameter of your roots. Um, but they are only so deep again. So even, even if we're looking at trees hundreds of years old, um, we may get about a meter and a half um, uh, of root cohesion. Um, and even those, you know, the, the trees that send down tap roots, uh, that, you know, you're not, it's, that's not, the taproot isn't doing much as far as cohesion. Um, so they get undercut, but there's where the other, this, you know, really other principle comes in is when they get undercut, we get wood recruitment to the channel. And if that tree is, uh, has any staying power, um, it starts to make a big difference. And there was a doctoral uh, thesis came out of Indiana um, and in the Midwest, the, the old sycamores that used to grow along the, the rivers there, uh, they got as big as some of our dug firs. I mean, they 12 feet in diameter. Um, and throughout uh, development of the uh, Mississippi and Missouri, um, you know, they were pulling big snags out of uh, those rivers. So, but even that in his work, a um, guy named Koshner, he found that even if the wood was just there for a little while, it made a difference in slowing erosion by even a factor of up to 10 uh, less than if there were no, no trees at all. So kind of similar again, consistent with the, the Sacramento work and the work I did on the West side. And then we just recently completed some work on the Newakum. And again, same, same kind of results that you know, as a general uh, rough rule of thumb, you know, where you don't have trees, it, you can expect at least a doubling in the erosion rate. So why is that? You know, if the roots are up high and, uh, you're, you know, not giving you cohesion down where the erosion's happening. Well, this is a neat picture um, sketched uh, by George Caitlin in 1832 when he was going up the Missouri. Um, and you can just see all that roughness that's along the bank. Um, and I just added that old, the picture you are, you know, the map you'd already seen. So that roughness can make a big difference. So as we know, it also creates a whole lot of great habitat and cover, but it also is being, is, is a very effective way of, of reducing, um, the rate of erosion. It may not be stopping it, but it's, uh, it's definitely reducing it. So, uh, so we can start to take this and, you know, apply it to our, a stress partitioning for how we get, um, how we deal with the toe of our bank. So here's just a, a, a little conceptual figure here. So on the, 
uh, x axis here is just you know your relative distance from the bank, and then um, the y axis is 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 intended to be um, velocity as far as the curve. So as as you with a a very rough bank, you're getting you're pushing your velocity further away from the bank, and that um, again is is going to be helping reduce the erosion along that bank. So um, those of you familiar with hydraulics, you know, have seen similar types of curve. Um, it's kind of a, just like the law of the wall with a, the smoother the surface, um, the tighter that curve and the higher the shear stresses are along that, that boundary. So if we can roughen things up, um, it's to our advantage. And then of course, that is also creating a lot of low velocity um, uh, habitat, not just for fish, but for fine sediment to deposit, which then can be the foundation for uh, getting plants established along the, the, the toe of the banks uh, where you put that roughness. So even if you're building, you know, even if you have someone building a, you know, rock revetment, the rougher we can make these features, the better off we'll be. Um, for both for the integrity of the structure as well as I think ecologically. So here is uh, another little image from the field. This is up on the South Fork Nixack. There's a farm pasture uh, and on the, on the left there looking upstream and the South Fork has incised quite a bit. So it's, it's cut down and we've been able to document it um, over historic time that uh, in, um, it's cut down in this reach about four to six feet below where it used to be. So that used to be a, a surface that was regularly flooded pretty much every year. Um, now it barely overtops in a hundred year event. So the erosion, you can see that's been occurring um, and you could kind of over on the right see an active floodplain is in is is quite a bit lower um, and in the process of eroding into the pasture it's exposed an, an old log jam um, you know some we recently dated one uh, something like that expo uh, exposure like this on the Skagit um, you know as eight and it came in about 800 years old um, so these features can actually then go on to, to help slow the erosion down and even uh, stop it. And like in the case of here, um, it had it eroded a little bit more and then, uh, um, uh, you know, pretty much stopped and, and, moved, and the channel moved elsewhere. Um, so here is a, a little example of uh, um, on the uh, back to the Tianaway. So here is uh, 2003, and here is, well, I could, I'll go back. You can see there's a couple rock barbs um, there. So that there's, uh, if you see my cursor, um, you know, th these, are, these are kind of, these barbs are kind of like Benway Weir, so it, they're intended to flow come over, over the top of them and redirect the uh, grade line. Um, and stream flow away from the bank, but um, they didn't do so well um, in that particular case, and we got a lot of erosion. But you can see so that in about, um, uh, let's see, 2013 here, right? Uh, so it, I'm not sure you. All, someone may know on the phone too, because uh, I wasn't involved with this project. Um, but the you can see that they put a bunch of wood in the toe of the bank there and then laid back the slope um, and that's you know that's exactly kind of what you want to do um, we're doing you know some projects with even you know about 10 times as much roughness as as you see here these days um, and getting getting that roughness down low is really important because that's where your maximum shear stress are but that's also where the fish are too and so you know when wood is down in the water um, it's going to, it's also going to last a lot longer. Um, but sloping the bank back is really important because that's where you can get your 
trees, I mean, your plants and uh, trees to, to really start providing cohesion that means something. Um, you know, so if you've got them starting down low, that's gonna make a big difference. So if you basically have your, um, your more hardened toe that then is stitched to your plants through their rooting, then you could, you've got a really effective way to, um, to, to slow or stop the erosion. And the other thing we've been doing a lot more and, um, and never seem to have enough is, is slash. We're just using a whole lot nowadays and not just in uh, wood structures, but we're using it as a soil amendment. So if, when you lay back a bank like, like this, we over excavate um, maybe uh, anywhere, you know, 12, 18 inches. And then we, we basically track roller compact or track compact um, slash and, and then with our soil and that, that, that slash can act like a pre-made uh, 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 a geotechnical fabric, you know, so without having to use, you know, uh, um, artificial materials or uh, petrochemical products, we could put that slash down, get a, a really nice resistant buried layer that also helps retain moisture more effectively in the in the soil column. So that you know, again, um, if you guys have opportunities with slash, and it's hopefully not, of course, it can be a weed source, so that's a concern. But um, but if uh, especially or if you are composting, like one of the, the morning speaker Gail, I believe, was talking about um, to help sterilize it, that is just really great material to integrate into your uh, as you rebuild a bank and then this is just you can see that that bank coming back um, with a nice riparian buffer um, so that you know is I think the the big uh, lesson here is that combination of roughness at the toe um, a sloped bank and then an aggressive planting um, can get these uh, much more effective um, buffers established uh, where we need them. So another thing I'll bring up here that um, we've seen with our rivers and has definitely happened uh, in many parts of the Yakima is, uh, is the simplification of our, our river. So, um, and this is, you know, a lot of the, those of you have been tracking and as um, Dale brought up this morning to, the uh, stage zero, or I, I kind of like prefer maybe the, the what some people call the valley reset. Um, that river, you know, single channel rivers, at least in alluvial valleys, were not typical. It, you know, at, you know, single channel systems were typical in canyons and um, more more confined valleys, but in big alluvial valleys all over. Um, we see that rivers uh, in their natural state, particularly with heavily vegetated uh, valley bottom, had numerous channels. Um, and then we're, and we're seeing that um, as, you know, I think many of you are seeing it even as we, as we do more and more restoration. Um, the work we've done on the Elwha and, uh, it, you know, the Elwha and its alluvial valleys now there's hardly any part of it that doesn't have multiple channels. The image on the left is the the some early work um, from Jim Siddell, one of his grad students in the 80s, just showing the simplification of the Willamette. Um, and so, as you can imagine, when you you start to concentrate all that water into a, a single channel, uh, you can get a more erosive, more powerful river than when you spread it out, which of course is a fundamental part of the, the stage zero or valley reset concept. Um, and, uh, and, and also you're gonna be much more prone to, for channel incision. And channel incision um, is, is happening all over um, the world because of, uh, of human actions. And it's, it has a huge effect on all sorts of geomorphic processes, but of course, uh, our riparian vegetation and floodplain vegetation, because incision down cutting of the channel leads to down 
dropping of the water table, um, which then has serious consequences, of course, to the riparian community. Um, and on the, the right is just an example um, of some historic change. I've got time again on the x-axis. And then the, the blue triangles are the unvegetated channel width on the upper, this is the upper calots. Um, and then um, on the, um, so just on the other side of the uh, Natchez actually, so uh, the pass, but, um, and then this is, and you can see that going up dramatically in the 70s and um, into the 90s. Um, and the number of forested islands uh, dropping down at the same time. So again, we, we see this that's happened in a, in a lot of rivers. Um, and that then, uh, uh, you know, really underscores this uh, effect of incision. So this is um, some images of uh, some work we kicked off, are kicking off for the Mid-Columbia Fish Enhancement Group and on the Kittitas um, reach of the Yakima. And this is up, uh, Tainum Creek is coming in at the upper left on that top uh, image. And uh, we're looking upstream and you could see the, the inset floodplain on the left there and the disconnected floodplain on the right. And on the, the little color image on the, the right there is the uh, relative elevation map. So that's basically we've colored the pixels according to their elevation above the the river, um, and uh, so blue being the river, and then the green, the light light blue is it would be your uh, your active bars and, and merging floodplain, and then the green and tan is the high ground. So you could see relic channels clearly are up there, but they're largely dis uh, disengaged or disconnected from the river. And if we go down um, to the um, uh, lower end of the Kittitas Reach, you know, right before the, the river gets into the canyon, um, we see a very different river. We see low banks, um, uh, some really healthy floodplain forest conditions, on the right, you see there a very different relative elevation map with all sorts of channels and, uh, you know, basically low ground that is um, going to, is able to get inundated frequently. So back to the kind of uh, beginning, those low banks mean we're getting root cohesion right down close to, um, to the river. Uh, to the you know and and more effect it's more if it's it's going to retard the the cohesion actually will play more of a role in retarding the uh, uh, erosion and of course by definition if we're we're growing a healthy for riparian forest then we've got a a, a good source of wood recruitment that is uh, can add that second part of the uh, uh, the story in in roughening the the banks so. Um, so anything we could do to, you know, more and more we're seeing, like whether it's the, the stage zero or valley reset, um, the, the work we've been doing on, uh, uh, you know, alluvial groundwater, where we're trying to bring channel, the, treat these incised channels, get them back up um, so that we can raise the water table, re-engage these surfaces, um, and create the more healthy riparian conditions and better spread out floods, which has benefits to uh, reducing flood peaks downstream too. So I think that's the end of my talk there. So uh, I kept it short for once. <laughs> um, so any questions? Great, thanks a lot, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, let's see if we got some questions coming in here. Um, someone asked, uh, they forgot to write down the reference on reduced flood risk and levee failure uh, associated with wood and vegetation in the floodplain. If you could share that again. 
Oh, sure. And it's fine if we want to uh, distribute the the PowerPoint too. And I, I've got a reference for, I forgot to reference my own work, so I can add that for folks, folks too. We've got a few more minutes for questions if uh, anybody else has any, if they wanna uh, throw in the chat box. So I see Dale's got a question about the Army Corps. Um, uh, I've tracked uh, the the work of the Army Corps. Um, met with folks um, from the, you know everywhere from the St. Louis district to the uh, Portland and Sacramento district to Seattle district, um, and I you know it's um it, it's been frustrating and uh you know because the 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 work is overwhelming that when you add trees even to your levy uh they stabilize the river you know that the core even commissioned some work out of that came out of germany um looking at uh how whether trees pose a risk to to levies um and you know the the work, all of the work overwhelmingly shows that uh, trees, they um, the roots of course strengthen the levee, and they do another really important thing. They they reduce um, burrowing um, animals, and burrowing animals are a major cause of piping, uh, which then can lead to to le uh, levee failure. Um, so you know with some levees where you don't have uh, uh, trees, you're going to be, you're going to, they're prone to more burrowing. Um, and it, you know, of course, the other thing that always help people, uh, remind people is levees and revetments are totally different things. And sometimes we see them, they're consistent with one another because, and, and the core, I think, drives that too, which is that they, you know, you, like with uh, the examples Dale showed of the levee setbacks where we build uh, the rock revetment on the face of the levee um, and that unfortunately can lead to not having any trees when the river gets to the levee you just it's back up against a big rock uh, embankment and so at, at one point we I and some others were really trying to get the core to consider you know if you look look back at um, uh, just how far we've come in river engineering you know, when I started, we, you know, engineers where everybody was still building your simple trapezoid. Um, and I, one of my early boss was a, a PhD engineer, and yet he, he spent much of his early career just simply trying to get the engineering community to, to move to, to a complex trapezoid, you know, where you have a, a two or three stage uh, system instead of a one one trapezoidal cross section between two levees and um and so we've come a long way since that but i'd like to use that analogy to say we need to turn levees into something similar like if if we do want trees between our infrastructure and our river which i would argue is a really good idea both for the safety of the infrastructure and for the fact that then there'll be shade and cover when the river does get there, um, then you know we need to separate the revetment from the levee, and we need to put the you know create a, uh, a a bench is what we've been calling them on the inboard side of the levee, where we've got um, our revetment structure and whether it's rock or engineer log jams, whatever uh, it might be, and then that bench is planted, and then you've got trees that can mature over the long term and then if that bench then even if if the core is is uh requiring that um you keep trees off the levee uh 
which you know if if you want their certification and them to help fund maintenance that's t typically what you have to do but then you've still got the bench where trees are growing um between you and the river and um and when the, you know and and that's protected and so but you know again it's been hard to get that through we we are um we have designed a project that hopefully will go to construction on the lower white where um there's a, a burlington northern track on one side and we're gonna put in a bench like that and then we'll basically build the erosion protection on the this edge of the bench um so that there'll always be trees if it, uh no matter where the river get you know when, when or where it gets to that uh that boundary Thanks, Tim. We have uh, one more probably uh, question and a comment. Uh, the question is, if you have any data on relative shear reduction achieved by tow wood installation plus laying back banks or and uh, cutting bankful bench as a function of the slope. Um, he said, well, you can do both great, but sometimes you can only get the former and want to decide how much stream power reduction you can expect. Yeah. Um yeah i we do have some there are a few publications on that um and in let's see in one of my book chapters i've got some of that um and then you know andrew simon when he was uh you know in in the um b stem model the banks uh stability toe erosion uh, erosion model it uh um it, it, I believe the latest version kind of integrates um, and, can, and has some, even some default values of if you add roughness to the toe. Um, but people are, um, you know, folk, I'm well happy to correspond and send the references, some of the references I have um, on, uh, um, on some of that. But that's a great, great question. And, uh, um, uh but yes we do have some data and numbers on and it, you know it's it it can be significant but it all again it depends on how what kind of how you do that roughness um in other words i would tell you just putting a few root wads in the toe of your bank is is definitely not enough um and uh um and you could you know there's ways to to do do add a lot of roughness even um without root wad logs i think sometimes people have uh kind of overused root wads and since they are it is a pretty high disturbance to to be tipping trees not only that it's more expensive to get them to your site there's a, a lot you can do with regular logs it's just you will you, you will need more but i'm happy to talk to people about that too but Great, thanks, Tim.